Clark and Roney, Jen and Nathan Orris, and have we got a show for you tonight. We have uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Zarney and Tara Weaver here with us to talk about the Asheville's former community access television and media complex known locally as URTV. We will be talking about the life and times of the organization, its rise, demise, and what may come next. We also have the Swannanoa Journal for more. Welcome back to the Asheville News Hour. Um, sitting here now with Jonathan Zarney and Tara Maney, soon to be Weaver. That's right. We're going to get an explanation of that. <laughs> we just had a wedding guy uh, person in here. So, is there. Well, this is even better. It's the kind of name change you choose yourself. You have to pay a little at the courthouse, but you don't have to come. It doesn't come with all the baggage and the. Uh, it doesn't come with a partner? The trauma, yeah. <laughs> well, I have to say my, my favorite quote about marriage is uh, from Mae West, and she said, uh, marriage is a fine institution. I'm just not ready for an institution yet, so. <laughs> I second that. Yeah. It's a good one, Jonathan. Wait a minute. What am I saying? My wife's over there. That's right. And I hear you have an anniversary coming up. 25, yeah. So, um, Jonathan and Tara are here from uh, the now defunct URTV, Asheville's free media access, public access media complex, was it? What was the official term? It was the Western North Carolina Community Media Center, and we manage the public access channel for Buncombe County and Nashville City. That's what we commonly refer to as URTV. Right. All right. Well, and you were involved with that from the beginning, I understand? I'm actually the operations manager. Not quite the beginning. Beginning is always where is the beginning. Right. Um, I became involved. The grand opening was in August of 2006, and I was there the week after that and every day since. Close enough for me. So there was a, actually it was a pretty long fight to get public access in Asheville. I think they started in 1992 uh, to get public access in Asheville because there was a, a cable company in the community, and the community is supposed to have access to a channel because they use right. public land to lay their cable, and they make a profit off of it. So that was the deal. Is the community is supposed to get something back from that i.e. public access, education access, government access. And the funding always came from the cable companies with a kickback, uh, a kick-in from the local government as well, or no? No, there was never a kick-in from the local government. It's actually always been from cable companies. This is a big myth about public access, and this is something that I've had to answer the question to many, many times. Well, I, don't, yeah. I don't like my tax dollars paying for them hippies to have their shows. And it's like, okay, buddy, your tax dollars don't pay for this. It's actually cable companies have to pay it. There's a certain amount of money that cable companies kick in before. Now, this is very complicated. I'm going to try to do my best. Um, up until just recently, it was always a local franchise agreement. Charter was a local company. They paid Buncombe County and Asheville City directly um, money from their subscriber fees. And so that money, the county and the city only acted as a pass-through. They right. still didn't go into the general fund. It was specifically set aside for PEG channels. PEG stands for public access, education access, and government access. So on your charter, Channel 2 is, the I think, the county channel. Channel 11 is the city channel. Right. Channel, so those are both G. That's the capital G. And then Channel 16 was the education channel. So the that's UNC G. TV? Uh, no, actually. Is that part of it? No, that's not. UNC oh. TV actually is run through the statewide university system completely separate. Oh, see, I thought that was tied in with Most people did think the same thing. It's not. It's completely separate. It's almost like it's people confuse it with PBS, too. They're like, oh, well, I just gave you the PBS. Why should I give my... It's not the same. Totally different thing. Right. Very good. Um, when you... You were one of the few paid staff I'm yes, we had we had three full time staff people. Mm -hmm. You um, and describe these people. Who was who? I was the there? operations manager, so my my job entitled uh, actually being I considered it or I described it as uh, it's pretty actually difficult to describe, but I was considered the air traffic controller of all things that went in. There was we had two television studios, a radio studio, and also editing equipment that people could come in and use, field gear that people could check out, like a library book, take a camera out, shoot an event, and bring it back. Um, then there's reservations involved with all that, and making sure that everyone's like you know actually bringing the gear back. Right. Um, so I pretty much managed all of that, and then there was a whole lot of, how would you describe it, um, putting out fires and juggling three things at the same time that are on fire with one hand tied behind your back, so that was me. Many, now, like your average times, technical department. Yeah. Right? yeah, many times right before a show or in the middle of a show, someone would come flying out of a studio, and you know Jonathan would have to run flying back into the studio and adjust things or hook things up. We don't know what he did, but it usually worked. Yeah, and then Tara, you were a producer, and you had, I think, a couple of different shows on the network? Uh, yeah, it started out as a hobby, and about two weeks later, it, it was a pretty full-time job. I was doing a weekly television show 
And um, once Jonathan set up the radio studio, um, I guess I was doing up to four different radio shows a week. So sometimes I was wow. in there eight hours um, just experimenting. Uh, you, know. you and Kim can probably have old home week. <laughs> yeah. Initially, my first shows in the radio were to fill the gap created. I had a big blank slate of void since I came out of this sort of fundamentalist cult, essentially. So I knew who the Beatles, I heard of a group called the Beatles, but I had no um, understanding of, I had no, nothing came up in my memory bank of what music they produced or context for any music. So I thought this will be a good way for me to fill that blank. <laughs> A cultural education, too. Well, it's quite interesting. That was actually the premise of one of her shows. She actually had four shows, and one of them was uh, to just kind of people in their playlists. And so her DJs or her guests that she would bring in would describe to her the music and what it meant to them and how it came out. And so it was actually pretty cool for me because um, actually yeah, this is my first time in Nashville FM, and I'm, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you guys doing your thing. I'm, I'm actually pretty honored to be a guest on your show. So thank you, Jeff, Kim, and Jen. Um, and I tell you, your green room out front is phenomenal. Yeah, it, it doubles up the cafe. Absolutely, it is great. Um, it's but, very green outside. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, to because I started UR Radio, which was the internet radio station, at the same time that Ashtel FM was starting, uh -huh. and uh, a mutual friend of ours, um, at least not personally, but whatever, um, had said, well, why don't you woo these people, and why don't you woo these people, and we can get them in, and it was like, I know the background of how Asheville FM started, and um, I kind of wanted to, you know, the obviously the door is open, but I could tell that everybody wanted to do their own thing, and that was beautiful, and that's exactly the kind of community that's supposed to happen, right. is, uh, you know, when you find people that are motivated and inspired and willing to work with each other, um, that's something you just let people run with, so there was no, I would have taken anybody, um, but I knew, I would want to make a radio station, internet radio station, before all of that even happened. So um, it was it was great to see, particularly someone like Sarah come in, who was mostly interested in, uh, or in, initially interested in the television aspects of it, um, to be like, oh, you can do that too? Oh, we can do that? Well, you're going to see me every day. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to dress up or fix your hair to be on radio. That's right. Come on in. I've been told I have a face for radio. <laughs> um, so what happened with URTV? Uh, uh, why did it actually close down? Oh, oh, man, how much time you got, Jeff? Um, be sure we're to do this in parts. Okay, well, <laughs> this is part one, Ben, and um, and actually, if you would have me back, I'd be honored. Uh, and I've thought about actually uh, trying to have a show here myself, so I'm looking forward to um, getting more involved because I feel like I was already involved in something that was very special to this community. I feel like I was already involved in building a community, and I watched uh, a handful of people tear it down, and uh, I want to get back involved. It, it broke my heart, and I had to heal, whatever, but I'm ready to get back involved in, in well, people that are doing it, too. So. This is your chance to get all Jerry Springer on them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Asheville's ready. Asheville's not ready for me. So, uh, In short, what happened was Buncombe County, um, as a pass-through, once again, the, the state law changed. It used to be a local franchise, charter paid Buncombe County and Asheville directly, right. and then as a pass-through, not as a whatever, um, they were supposed to give us that fund. The law change went to Charter Now Pays Raleigh along with every other cable operator, every other satellite operator in the state. And then the state, Raleigh, then sent those same funds. So there's a massive the bulk fund over in Raleigh somewhere. Well, not only that, it's also here. Buncombe County and Asheville are still getting their funding that they got in 2007. That funding has not dried up. That is exactly contradictory to what our community leaders have said. Our, our county commissioners, our city council people, none of these people understand it. So did the state decide they just wanted to cut two? Or are no, they, no. Is Charter paying both? No. How um, much was that sum? Uh, well, <laughs> where's it buried? Um, you How can, can we access it? The, the money that you can, if you want to look up, actually this is all public record. You can totally, right. and I encourage your listeners, if you're interested in um, your community and these funds are supposed, they're set aside for PEG access channels. Okay. Um, we're supposed to be getting it again. It's from the same source. It's from cable companies. It's not your tax dollars. It's, oh, it's a bad economy. We can't afford this right now. It's like this money's set aside. Oh, Raleigh is sending it. Buncombe County's getting it. Yeah. One Point five million dollars to the tune of one point five million dollars every year. So they're paying the state, but it's still being passed through to the local municipalities, and still and that's where it stops. Theoretically, being held by it's the, not theoretically. Is it the city, the county, or it's both? the county? It's the county. The city can't certify a public access channel. The over, the overarching county that is responsible for the service. Right. You figure we're talking about a cable company. Charter has to lay cable. A lot of their cable goes through county land, not necessarily city. Um, some city, but because the city's in the county. 
it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Point being is the county is the only one who can certify the channel. They're right. getting $1.5 million every single year from Raleigh for peg channels. Wow. I think that they are entertaining bids now on a replacement for URTV, at least that's the way I understand it. That, what do you know about that process? Uh, well, I'll tell you that uh, how, how our community leaders have uh, pretty much abandoned uh, their community and neglected their role as stewards of these resources mm -hmm. broke my heart. Um, so for the last two months, I have been out of Asheville, uh, kind of healing in Nags Head and spending a lot of time on the beach meditating, figuring out what I want to do next. So I have, I have little bits and snippets of what's been going on. Oh, yeah. Um, my understanding is both the city and the county have put out a request for proposals, and public access is not necessarily a part of that. They're calling it a community media development. Right. Which is ridiculously vague. If you've looked at which the proposal. Which may or may not have educational components, and may or may not have public access, and may or may not be volunteer-based. It, exactly. And, it, and either way, it can hardly be run on the amount of money that they're proposing. Start from what I understand, yes. Yeah. From what out of a million and a half dollars a year, they're going to give sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something that, from what I understand, is it's going to be sixty thousand for the first year, forty thousand for the second year, twenty thousand for the third year, and that's it. Thank and you. and those funds are split between the city and the county. So theoretically, it's thirty thousand from the county the first year, fifteen thousand. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. Um, and the city gets a lot of money, too. We're talking about the county. The county is the one who is responsible. Let me be very clear to your listeners and anybody who may or may not hear this in the future. The county is who is responsible for the demise of URTV and public access in this county in Asheville. Okay. They reduced the funding 90%. They never said why. Um, and that is why. you can't. They can't say, oh, I support public access, and then be like, do it to make it self-sustainable. There's not a... I'm curious, and I hate to interrupt, but uh, why? what was their reasoning behind taking the funding away? I, I had heard all kinds of things about it. it was just because they were just wackos. There was the one preacher who seemed to have every other hour tied up, and, mm. and uh, you know, it was just turning into a, a religious channel. Uh, it wasn't truly access because you had to know somebody to get in. And wow, really? That's what? Who told you that? All that. It's just, you know, you, you hear these whispery things. You well, know. well, let me tell you, you. You go places, you meet people, you have a beer, pretty soon lifts start moving. And the, yeah, there's a lot of what comes out. There's a lot of whispery things around Asheville, and I will tell you that if you want to, um, you know, this is kind of the town I call you, you fake it till you make it, and uh, the people who are doing it are doing it, and the people who aren't are the ones that are whispering. Uh, what I've noticed about uh, one of the best experiences I've had there with public access and URTV was that it separated the people who were talking about doing things, which is like everybody in Asheville, right. versus the people who are actually doing it. Right. And I will tell you, as somebody who was there every single day from a week after it opened until the day it closed, there was not a single person who was denied access to that facility. Not a single person. You did not have to know anybody. You just had to know how to get there. You actually didn't have to know how to get there. You could look it up, find a bus, find a ride, listen, watch. Yeah. Um, there was not, and to be fair, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm totally going to take over your radio show. Um, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm not sorry because I'm, I'm, I'm part of a club where I'm not allowed to apologize. So no apologies. Uh, right. My bad. If I, uh, point being is that um, to speak to the, the idea that it's run by a bunch of wackos, okay, People confuse the programs they see on the channel with the management of the facility. Those are not the same thing. The staff does not make programs. That's why it's public access. The staff manages the resource and the facilities, not the programming. It's a First Amendment forum. So you know what? If the mad monk of Montford wants to come in with his beaver tails red and do a live show, we mm -hmm. put him on. Mm -hmm. um, so that was probably one of the underlying Made a convenient excuse. Uh, well, absolutely. And that's, <laughs> but, but what was such a shame was that, in, in my observation of living in this uh, area for the last 12 years, that's the only place that I have found so far that really actually was a diverse community because you had all these different producers, you know, from very conservative and, and um, you know, you had the extreme Christians and you had the Wiccans and the extreme, um, uh, you know, opposite sides of every and everything in between. And every level of socioeconomic uh, diversity also was represented there. I mean, there was... You, people who were homeless were producing programming. So there was this really uh, beautiful thing about no matter what was being actually created, the fact that it was being creative, that created, that these individuals were choosing to take their time and energy and create in and of itself was something that was really valuable to our community. Um, mm -hmm. It was, it was, there's nothing like it I found. Well, Jeff, to, to answer your question more specifically, there's, there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of people in this town who do not understand what public access is. That doesn't stop them from voicing their opinion on what they think it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and a very specific point on uh, that you just brought up was people were saying that maybe there was too much of religious programming or as one preacher was on all the time. Um, I actually have access to the records, the program records. We keep very specific records and of uh, everything, the programming, the equipment used, we have to. It's actually part of our contract. Right. Um, contract compliance is pretty important for the people who are liable. Um, the, uh, I looked at, uh, I compared uh, URCV to the programming analysis from Charlotte, which is a much bigger station, much bigger population, a lot more money coming to them. They had, their programming was 80% religious. Wow. 80% religious programming, which is typical of public access. Churches have all their own equipment, they got their gear, they got people that are reeling it, and they're cranking DVDs out. Right. That's typical. Asheville, Buncombe County, URTV, 25%. We were actually Seriously? almost perfectly split. 25%. Uh, we had four categories. We had inspirational, which was church stuff, um, community issues, uh, First Amendment, and then arts and culture. And it was almost 25, 25, 25. It was way better. And that's the thing. That's the saddest thing is I don't think people understood. Mm -hmm. And granted, you know, you watch your public access channel, you don't want to watch church. You want to, if you want to go to church, you go. You don't want to see it on TV. Right. But they don't understand public access enough to where they realize, oh, I see church programming. I see a lot of church programming. Maybe it's too much versus like, oh, let me compare it to somewhere else. And where it's 80% in Charlotte versus here is only, it was a quarter, almost an evenly perfect split. And that's, I think, speaks to what Tara was talking about with diversity of the programming. Mm -hmm. The people who were using it, it wasn't just churches. It wasn't just the right-wing weirdos. It wasn't just the left-wing weirdos. It wasn't just, it was everybody was using it. And it was a really magical thing to be a part of. That is a myth about URTV that I hope that people, um, if you saw public access somewhere else, I think more people would understand it. Anybody who understands public access came to URTV and was like, this is amazing. I can't believe you guys well, are doing. And I believe that the live programming was something also that Charlotte and other stations don't do. And I was shocked by the numbers to say that Asheville was competitive with some of the larger cities in the country in terms of our production rates. You know, when that's mind-boggling. Do you remember those details? How about uh, numbers of volunteers? I mean, you said you mentioned before separating the people who are actually doing it from the people who are talking about it. At, at its peak, how many people are we talking here when we when we talk about URTV? as a group. Um, it, it, I just want a mental image of what kind of crowd we're talking about here. I mean, is it enough to take over? No. <laughs> uh, there have been, um, if you look at the schedule, um, our schedule was full 24-7. When URTV first started, they didn't even have any programs. Um, we wow. had a camera on a fishbowl with a beta fish swimming around because they didn't have any programs. Um, we had a lot of initial interest in people, and I guess they called it members back then. Oh, I'm a member of URTV, but nobody's making any shows. Yeah. The converse of that happened. We, we, we filtered off the people who were like, oh, I'm a member of URTV but not doing anything, versus like, no, actually, I'm on TV. I'm on a show. Um, I think we had 14 live shows a week. Right. Um, and this is just this is just the television. We're not even talking about the radio yet, which I, that just got snuffed out before I had a chance to really water that seat. Because I'm telling you right now, I was looking. Well, never mind. Point being, a lot of people <laughs> were using it. A lot of people. We had 14 live shows a week. We had two different studios. We probably had um, our programming was not just competing with major market areas. Was crushing major market areas. Atlanta, the Atlanta Channel, the People's Channel, Atlanta. We annihilated their program. Everyone in the country who does public access was looking to Asheville as the model for how are you doing this? How are you doing this? We don't understand how you're getting this kind of um, participation from the community. Well, how does something that's that successful die such an ugly death? Not well. Not, I mean, not well. I mean, it wasn't pretty at the end. I mean, a lot of these producers had even reached outside markets because of what they produced on the show had then reached markets, they were getting calls internationally, they had followers, um, didn't someone, didn't one show the news, global news report, oh, actually, the news, global news report, the actually, global, report. global, you want to talk about that? Uh, the, the, the global report was one of our bigger um, success stories, and they actually had, um, they started out, I'm sure you guys are aware of the Asheville Global Report as an as a independent newspaper, and then when URTV opened and started, they kind of toyed with the idea of making a TV version of it. They actually got picked up by Dish Network, uh, Free Speech TV. They were the second most popular program on Free Speech TV after wow. Democracy Now. They started URTV. They were still taping their shows that were going to Democracy Now in our studios. Wow. So that's a major success story for us. That's just one. Um, we started web streaming the channel in 2009, and after that it was like crazy. And that's where people were like, 
you know, the, the thing with, it's, it's, it's kind of weird, you know, there's uh, the idea that, oh, well, you don't need a public access channel anymore because there's the internet, there's YouTube, there's Twitter, there's Facebook. People have the way to communicate. But if you don't have cameras, is YouTube going to give you a camera? Is YouTube going to give you access to studio equipment? Is YouTube going to teach you how to use it? Is YouTube going to provide you with a community of producers who are like might or may not be interested in the same things you are, or at least, right. hey, I don't like your political leaning, but how'd you get that camera angle? You know, there's, everyone is immediately interested. Well, um, unfortunately, we are uh, just about out of time. We need to wrap. So uh, I guess this really will be part one, and uh, I'm hoping that we can schedule you both again to uh, continue the conversation because there are a lot of questions that I haven't actually even really got to yet to talk about what may or may not happen with the future of uh, public access TV, public access media altogether in this area because it's an important issue and, you know, we got to find out what happened to that money. And, I want and you're not the only one who's confused. Even the producers there didn't have a clear concept of what was going on and what we could do to help. So there was a lot there. But, I mean, I will say that what it did, I can't emphasize enough, providing those resources allowed adults to have skill sets that they could then take. I'm currently making money when I couldn't find a job in the area, and I'm getting paid to do video jobs and video work because of the Community Media Center. So. Well, Jonathan Zarney, Tara Manning, thank you both for coming by. Thank you Thanks for having me. Uh, you're listening to the Asheville FM News Hour, and we got